Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. After the fire and fury of this historic election, some first determined steps forward. Restoring everything that we've lost the last four years. Peace. The president-elect signals his plans. Our work begins with getting COVID under control. But the current occupant of this house is digging in. So what happens now? Donald Trump forever. We'll come back. We'll be back. Oh, better than ever. Spiking COVID numbers across Canada. We are very much on a knife edge. New restrictions in many places, but will they stop the surge? If you're lucky enough to wind up on a show that the people take to heart, then uh, you're set. A global game show superstar who never forgot his Canadian roots. Remembering Alex Trebek, this is The National. Now that we know who the next U.S. president will be, attention shifts to what Joe Biden will do next. His task is both complicated and fraught to heal a wounded country split along political lines and being ravaged by a virus and to try to lead when the current president, Donald Trump, isn't backing down, continuing to claim this election was stolen from him. Once again tonight, our reporters are covering all the angles from Wilmington, Delaware, Washington, D.C., Georgia and Arizona. A priority for Biden is COVID. You may find today's numbers out of the U.S. stunning. More than 126,000 new cases in a single day, the highest number yet. Susan Ormiston is in Wilmington, Delaware tonight. And Susan, the celebration is done. Now it's time to get to work. Yeah, it's sinking in for America and the world, just not President Trump, that Joe Biden is pressing ahead with transition to the White House. On his first full morning as president-elect, Joe Biden went to mass, only the second Catholic to be elected president after John F. Kennedy. He took the day with his family after a momentous night, a somewhat messy victory, but a win on Biden's third attempt at the top job. For all those of you who voted for President Trump, I understand the disappointment tonight. I've lost a couple times myself, but now, Let's give each other a chance. Biden knows he faces the tens of millions who did not vote for him, and President Trump has still refused to concede. Former President George W. Bush congratulated Biden today, saying the election was fundamentally fair and the outcome clear. And now a demanding transition period, 72 days for Biden and Kamala Harris. Build Back Better is the Biden-Harris four-point transition plan launched on social media today. We will act on the first day of my presidency to get COVID under control. That's number one, with a COVID-19 task force being announced tomorrow. Also, day one, plans to address the economic crisis, racial justice, and climate change. Biden promises that the U.S. will rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement. Biden is expected to move swiftly after inauguration using executive orders to push through some of his policies. People want the country to move forward. They want to see uh, President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris uh, move forward on their agenda and have the opportunity to do the work to get the virus under control and to get our economy back together. We love Joe! We love Joe! Many Americans who celebrate the Biden presidency are yearning for another kind of transition from chaos to calm and decency. Restoring everything that we've lost the last four years. Peace, wow. joy, togetherness. It's okay to disagree, but we have to learn to agree to disagree. First though, the current White House resident needs to move out. Right, which normally wouldn't be that big a deal. You know, Biden is president, a uh, little about this election <laughs> call, Susan, uh, could be called normal. Yeah, you'd expect at this point a round of congratulatory messages from world leaders, and some have, like Trudeau and Boris Johnson, but notably, some haven't, like the presidents of Russia, Brazil, China and Turkey. No congratulations coming from them. Not the victory that Joe Biden likely imagined, but he probably knew that going up against Donald Trump. All right, Susan, thank you. On the other side of the political divide, Donald Trump, who is still insisting that he hasn't lost. Paul Hunter now with who has his back at this point and who's urging him to give up the fight. 
As he often does on the weekend, Donald Trump inside this motorcade went golfing again today, this time met by a handful of demonstrators, some shouting, loser. Trump continued along, seeming to relax as if he hadn't lost the election yesterday, with anger in this country growing over his refusal to concede and his insistence he'll now try to win re-election in court. I believe President Trump still has a path to victory. Today, some fellow Republicans made clear they stand with the president. At this point, we do not know who has prevailed in the election. We should allow the rule of law to operate. We should allow the legal process to move forward. This is a contested election. The media doesn't decide who becomes president. If they did, you would never have a Republican president for uh, forever. What we need in the presidential race is to make sure every legal vote is counted, every recount is completed, and every legal challenge should be heard. Then and only then that America will decide who won the race. To be clear, there remains no evidence for any of Trump's allegations that the vote was somehow rigged against him. Indeed, within the White House, rumblings of an intervention with son-in-law Jared Kushner and wife Melania now said to be quietly nudging Trump toward accepting reality. And yet, for the moment, Trump pushes on in his own world. These uh, lawsuits will be brought starting on Monday. At a bizarre news conference yesterday, set between a Philadelphia crematorium and an adult bookstore, Trump's lawyer underlined the legal battling has barely begun. Say those who know Trump, even those who have opposed him, none of this should be a surprise. But don't expect him to go quietly in the night. That's not how, uh, how he operates. So, Paul, if that is how Trump operates, what else might we expect between now and uh, the inauguration day? Well, no one is ruling out anything. Some are predicting he'll issue pardons for those who worked with him in the White House but who've since been arrested or convicted of crimes, or even perhaps a preemptive pardon for Trump himself, as he seems to think he can do, facing investigations on various fronts. Uh, might he randomly start firing people, Anthony Fauci, for example? But the real concern is what he might say to his most passionate supporters, many of whom will believe him if he continues to insist the election was stolen from him. If so, what might they do? It seems clear Trump has little desire to make things easier for Joe Biden, he has 73 days in which to make things more complicated. Ian. Thanks, Paul. While Joe Biden's lead over Donald Trump keeps growing, Trump's most ardent supporters are refusing to abandon him. They're protesting at the Vote Count Center in Phoenix, and that's where our David Common is tonight. And David, what's happening there? Well, Ian, it is clear that Trumpism isn't going anywhere, even if the current president is moving out. It's a good reminder about just how divided this nation is. And for all the scenes of jubilation that we saw yesterday, well, that sentiment is far from universal. Among the Trump faithful, there is anger and disbelief. 70 million Americans backed him, nearly half of all voters. There's fraud going all over the place. Some are certain victory is being stolen from them. Biden is not the president of the United States. Pass t -shirt, 10 bucks, 10 bucks. Yet Trumpers are not a monolith. Disappointment doesn't always mean rejection. As many have taken to the streets armed, there has been very little violence. Even when a Democrat walked into this crowd. What's the point? Are they going to kill me? I'm five foot one Ole. Are they going to shoot me? <laughs> it's absurd. All the division and fear doesn't mean there isn't also sympathy. I know that it's tough. I, I know that this is not the outcome that they wanted. Do you feel for the other side? Sure. I mean, it's in 2016. If you were a Hillary supporter, you were shocked and it was a difficult time. I just hope they don't like try to retaliate because the person they wanted didn't win. And Do you worry about that? A little bit, you know, a little bit. But Why? I mean, because um, I feel like it's mostly kind of targeting like African Americans in a sense and other ethnic ethnicities. A reminder, the election story amid worries, continued counting and legal challenges is still very much being written. Donald Trump forever, we'll come back, we'll be back oh. better than ever.
So David, it looks like you got out to the desert today, so that's nice. But, but where you are now, you've been every night uh, since the election. And what's the atmosphere like there tonight? Well, same sort of atmosphere, but a far, far smaller crowd. You know, just overall, looking at the people in here tonight, um, maybe 30-ish people. Uh, there were some kids with hula hoops in there a little earlier. So the atmosphere has changed. You know, you still have people who are very diehard to the cause and uh, say that this election has been stolen, but their numbers have been decreasing, at least here in Arizona. A lot of that activity continuing online, of course, but that doesn't seem likely to go anywhere anytime soon. Yeah. Okay, David, thank you. The Democrats have reclaimed the White House, but Joe Biden will find it hard to govern without regaining control of the Senate. And that depends on voters in Georgia. And that's where Katie Simpson is tonight. Ian, voters in Georgia are about to show the world whether the flip from supporting Republicans to Democrats was a one-time thing. This ain't the 1960s. This ain't the Atlanta y'all used to know. This Democrats are about to find out if this moment has become a movement. We really need the Senate in order to ensure that crucial legislation can get through. Georgia voters will determine which party controls the U.S. Senate. Special elections will be held here in January for the state's two seats that are up for grabs. I know you're going to be on side with me as we push forward to keep the Senate in Republican hands. It may come down to this seat. Yeah. If Democrats win both open seats, there will be a 50-50 split in the Senate, which would essentially give the party control as incoming Vice President Kamala Harris would play the role of tiebreaker. We're incredibly excited about the work that's been done on the ground for the last decade to bring us to this point. And we're so excited to be going blue. Stacey Abrams mobilized hundreds of thousands of voters ahead of the presidential election and is vowing to continue her work for the Senate races, though Democrats admit it's an uphill battle. When it comes to the Senate, I feel confident, even though there is still work to be done. Um, I feel like after a lot of the people on the other side see how we've won tonight, they're going to come really hard January 5th. President-elect Joe Biden will have a better chance at implementing his agenda if Democrats control the Senate. If not, his achievements will be determined by how much cooperation he can get from Republicans. And to make progress, we have to stop treating our opponents as our enemies. Uh, look, I, I, uh, I congratulate him, but I'm not going to uh, put aside conservative principles. We're going to fight for the things that we believe in. Republicans are going to fight hard to win these seats, making the argument Republicans need to maintain control of the Senate in order to keep the Biden administration in check. Ian. Katie Simpson in Atlanta tonight. Justin Trudeau among the world leaders congratulating the president-elect and some in the Trudeau government are hoping the change in Washington will refresh and renew the relationship with Ottawa. Ashley Burke explains. Joe Biden's ties to Canada run deep. The relationship's so important, he paid Ottawa a visit before his final month as vice president. Viva la Canada. <laughs> Yesterday, the prime minister was so eager to congratulate Biden, he did it within an hour of his win. We are also looking very much uh, forward uh, to work with the new administration. The foreign affairs minister told the CBC's chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, he's already preparing for a more predictable tone rather than the often erratic approach with the Trump administration, which sought trade clashes and tariffs. In international affairs, stability and predictability uh, are key elements uh, in order to, to build these relationships. So certainly we look forward uh, to do that. Do you think that the damage that was done potentially by the current administration can be undone? What happened in the last four years uh, in, in terms of, of some of those relationships uh, we, we can rebuild. That's something lawmakers south of the border already expect. This relationship has taken a major hit uh, over the past uh, four years because of the arrogance of, of this president. And uh, Joe Biden will correct that immediately. Changing Trump's policies is task number one for Biden, including tackling COVID. That plan will be built on bedrock science. A message resonating with Canada where there's tight border restrictions. Replacing a president who calls climate change a hoax, Biden is committed to taking action. But that also means rescinding support for Canada's Keystone XL pipeline. We're going to be making our case, uh, saying that Canada is the most reliable 
uh, energy uh, supplier to the United States. A new administration brings other new challenges too, including Biden's Buy America policy. Trump remains president until January 20th. Champagne said today he would not be traveling to the U.S. to meet with President-elect Biden until after Trump leaves office. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Now to the big story here at home. As the days get shorter, the COVID-19 pandemic in Canada is growing, and it is increasingly threatening lives. The number of people hospitalized with the virus across the country, now nearly 1,400. More than 50 people are dying each day. Comparing that to the first wave, it's on par with what Canadians faced in early April. Ontario and Quebec started introducing restrictions weeks ago, but if targeted shutdowns have put pressure on the curve, it's not enough. Average daily new cases in both provinces are still increasing. It's not quite this little guy's birthday yet, but with rising cases and spring-like November weather, his family decided to celebrate early. The birthday is like, you know, a couple of months down the road, and I'm like, okay, let's just do it this weekend. Even as Ontario breaks a daily case record, two of the province's hotspots, Ottawa and York, are easing restrictions. Ontario had the same plans for Peel as well, but that region is adding stricter measures instead. Peel residents are asked to restrict contact to members of their own households, even in their yards. Local health officials say the region's numbers are headed in the wrong direction. We are very much on a knife's edge in the region of Peel. Uh, once our hospital capacity starts getting challenged, uh, that's, uh, that's a sign that we really need to take these measures seriously. Some experts say COVID fatigue is partly why cases are climbing. Private gatherings are a big problem. We all know a party of 200 people, of course, that's going to be a huge transmission risk, but so is having a thousand groups of, you know, people of 15 at your house having dinner. With rules always changing, keeping up can also be a challenge. You can get together outside in the park and not, not have people come into your front yard. It is kind of sending a confused, confusing message. But many would rather see more restrictions than more cases. Because if you don't have that in place, then, you know, people are going to you know, exploit it and sort of take advantage of it. So I think it's a good idea. Meanwhile, Toronto, which continues to see the highest number of daily cases in the province, will stay with current restrictions for another week. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. In Western Canada, per capita, case rates are as bad or worse than Ontario's. And in B.C. this weekend, that's led to the announcement of new restrictions. But Briar Stewart is tracking an increasingly familiar reaction. Public confusion. This is one of three spin studios run by Dominic Desbois, which now sit empty after new restrictions were rolled out in Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Health. Places that run group fitness classes are being shut down for two weeks and there's confusion around when it comes to reopening. What are our next steps? Who do we contact? When can we expect to reopen? Is this really going to last two weeks or should we prepare for, you know, multiple two week segments? We, we just need to know. The restrictions apply to an area with more than 2 million people where cases have been rapidly rising. This next two weeks will be critical for us. Health officials are also advising against non-essential travel and are urging people not to socialize with anyone outside their household. These restrictions apply outdoors and also in restaurants, but they're still open along with bars. And some are encouraging people to come out as long as they aren't in groups greater than six. Our message today is partly we want people to stop having private gatherings, come out to the bars and restaurants where we can keep you safe, keep you socially distanced. The province has said that private gatherings have partially fueled the recent spike in cases. Well, I would say doubling times between one and two weeks. Carolyn Colain has been working on mathematical modeling of COVID-19 and isn't sure whether the new restrictions are enough. Anything we do for two weeks is, is so temporary. We'll barely have seen the impact of it before it ends. So I'm hoping they have a plan beyond two weeks. Because there's no quick fix for slowing the spread of the virus and the same risks will be there when these restrictions are lifted. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. And Manitoba is fast approaching a crisis, the highest daily infection rate per capita in the country. Hospitals struggling, and as Aaron Broman explains, a scene unfolding in long-term care that has left at least one paramedic horrified and ashamed. 
This was a sight Cheryl Lorenko never wanted to see. Her mother lives at this home. Lorenko races to it every time she hears sirens. I watched it. I watched them come out in their white hazmat outfits. It's terrifying. And to be left in the dark, to not really know, like, what, why are they going in there, right? Someone who says they were among the paramedics responding to a 911 call Friday at the home posted this message on Reddit, describing what they found as something out of a nightmare. Paramedics treated at least a dozen people and sent three to hospital. Two people were already dead when they got there. It is not a, a, a usual, I'm going to say, scenario in a personal care home. The Winnipeg Regional Health Authority and operator Rivera confirmed eight people from the home died within 48 hours and announced the deployment of a backup health care team to the site. Eight deaths in less than 48 hours and a paramedic speaking up. Why did it take that to finally get some relief? This was devastating news. On Sunday, Manitoba's health minister launched an investigation into two care homes run by Rivera, where together 45 people have died since the pandemic began. Keeping COVID-19 out of our care homes has been one of the greatest challenges. More clearly needs to be done. As the Winnipeg police lead their own assessment. But it's too late. Um, We've had 22 deaths in less than two weeks in Maple's personal care home. Um, and the cries for help with the staffing, that, that, that had happened already. Her mother doesn't have the virus, but she worries it's just a matter of time. Erin Broman, CBC News, Winnipeg. So let's hear what Dr. Isaac Bogosh has to say. As you know, an infectious disease doctor here in Toronto. And Dr. Bogosh, why do you think we're still seeing record case numbers in Ontario and Quebec, even though both provinces uh, have tightened restrictions in hotspots for, for a few weeks now? Yeah, it's really unfortunate to watch these numbers present themselves with, with record highs. I think the measures that have been taken have actually done something. They just haven't done as much as we would have liked. So they've likely slowed the rate of growth. But of course, we haven't seen it plateau or decline just yet. And to really get that, we need to have a better understanding of who's getting infected, where they're getting infected, the context to which they're getting infected, so you can have data-driven policy to get those numbers down. And as we just saw in Winnipeg, two care homes uh, have been the site of deadly COVID-19 outbreaks. Given all that's happened in this country months ago, why, why is this still happening? It's really unfortunate to watch. We know that about 80% of the deaths in Canada are from long-term care homes. Are there lessons that we learned from the first wave? It's not entirely clear if those lessons have been implemented, but certainly there's been policy to help prevent the introduction of cases into long-term care facilities. And then infection prevention and control measures should be implemented such that if it is introduced, it can't be transmitted from person to person. We've seen this in a few other places outside of Manitoba. We're seeing this in Ontario and in parts of Quebec. And I think we need to step it up to really help protect the most vulnerable amongst us. Dr. Bogosh, thanks a lot. My pleasure. Longtime Jeopardy host Alex Trebek has died. My life would not have been the same without him. Up next, remembering a Canadian icon who meant so much to so many. Plus, why counselors at Kids Help Phone are speaking out about their own mental health. Things got, like, really difficult to keep up with. Our Go Public team investigates the stories on the other end of the line. And later, a historic moment seen around the world. It was like an out-of-body experience. What Vice President Kamala Harris means to many women. We'll be right back. Alex Trebek, the longtime host of Jeopardy, has died after a lengthy battle with pancreatic cancer. He was 80 years old, and tributes, of course, are pouring in. From the Prime Minister, we've lost an icon. Actor Ryan Reynolds tweeting, he was curious, stalwart, generous, reassuring, and of course, Canadian. And from astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, farewell, patron saint of geeks. Deanna Sumanak Johnson now in the life of a legendary TV host. Now, here's your host on Music Hop, Alex Trebek. In the early 1960s, when he was a host of music and variety shows on CBC, 20-something Alex Trebek was already Alex Trebek poised, confident, and knowledgeable in many subjects. Well, we want to acquaint you people in the Toronto area with a lot of new talent. After hosting talent. quiz shows throughout the 1970s, including CBC's Reach for the Top, Trebek landed the gig as host of Jeopardy in 1984. 
And now, here is the host of Jeopardy, Alex Trebek. The show had been on and off the air before, but this time around, it found its perfect host. As decades rolled on, TV trends changed. Still, Jeopardy stayed on the dial, its host, Trebek, a uniquely calm and reassuring presence in primetime. One of the other things that didn't change? Trebek never forgot where he came from, as one Canadian Jeopardy contestant after another attested. He even mentioned the show after I had won that uh, he missed seeing me around. My friends were saying, oh, I think he likes you because, you know, you're from Canada and he's still got a soft spot for Canadians. So. Well into his 70s, Trebek continued to be plugged into pop culture, appearing on hit shows like How I Met Your Mother. And you're Canadian? Who has set the tone of the quiz show Jeopardy? In 2017, he received the Order of Canada. Then, in 2019, a major setback. This week, I was diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer. Now, normally, the prognosis for this is not very encouraging. But I'm going to fight this. And I'm going to keep working. That he did, even honoring a commitment in Ottawa while undergoing chemotherapy. If you made a commitment to an important group, and a lot of people are counting on you. Uh, unless I'm dead, I'm coming. True to his word, Trebek continued to host Jeopardy as long as his health allowed, ensuring that sometime in the future, a question like this may well come up on Jeopardy. A Canadian who educated and entertained millions with his polish and unexpected sense of humor. The answer, who is Alex Trebek? Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Kids Help Phone offers mental health support 24-7 to young people in this country, a need which has become more critical during the pandemic. But as Diane Buckner tells us, some of the Kids Help Phone counselors say they're the ones now in distress. I heard a girl on the other line sobbing. This video was made by Kids Help Phone, featuring its counselors talking about the type of heart-wrenching calls they get every day. You should find out that he was having thoughts of suicide himself. The organization has given support and even restored hope to countless young people. But its own staff say they need more support. Things got like really difficult to keep up with, with um, my own mental health and, and seeing people around me kind of burning out. It was all about like hitting target and increasing numbers. CBC News is protecting the identities of these two former counselors. They fear their careers will be damaged by revealing the way Kids Help Phone micromanages its staff to the minute. How long we were able to take breaks and how long we needed to be on the phone and how many calls were we taking. The organization uses software to track counselors' activities. Breaks are strictly monitored. Counselors used to be given ample time to recover after the most disturbing calls. No more. I got told, you went a minute over your lunch. What are we going to do about it? This expert on call centers says the type of work done at Kids Help Phone isn't suited to corporate-style metrics of efficiency. The issue with this type of monitoring is that it really contributes to employee emotional burnout. Okay, And when employees are burnt out, they really can't perform uh, at their best. Reach out to Kids Help Phone. In March, the government announced an additional $7.5 million in funding for Kids Help Phone. 20 new counselors were hired by June. More are coming. So far, that hasn't reduced stress, says this counselor, and complaints to management have gone nowhere. Kids Help Phone declined our request for an on-camera interview, but after being told about its counselor's decision to go public, it now says it will abandon the strict performance targets and offer more mental health support to its own team. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, more reaction from the United States. From celebrations in the streets to a tough road ahead, we'll look at what's next for President-elect Biden with our U.S. political panel. Just a few of the scenes across the U.S. after yesterday's election win for Joe Biden. A catharsis for many after four years of volatility and bitter division. And not just for Americans. In many ways, Joe Biden's win is a vote of confidence in political stability itself. After five decades in Washington, Biden may be everything Donald Trump was not. 
methodical, measured, patient. Adrian takes a closer look at America's 46th president. I ask everyone to stay calm, all the people to stay calm. Being calm has served him well. Joe Biden has been working in the American political machine for almost 50 years. Those aviators are his look, rolling up his sleeves, his style. Joseph Biden Jr. was born in 1942 in Scranton, Pennsylvania to a modest family, he always said. His father, a car salesman who eventually moved the family to Delaware. He says he grew up bullied, struggling with a debilitating stutter. And I was so ashamed and so embarrassed. The stutter still shadows him sometimes, and he knows he's not the only one. Hey, Brayden, how are you, man? Taking time on the trail to reach out to a kid struggling too. He says he's done that all his life. Don't let it define you. Biden was elected to the Senate in 1972, the youngest in Congress at just 30. And then came the cruelties. He had to take the oath beside his son Bo's hospital bed. His wife and baby daughter had been killed in a car crash just one month before. Caring for his sons and learning the ropes of his new job consumed him. But as he and they healed, he eventually married again. And with Jill Biden now at his side, he made a presidential run in 1988. It didn't last long. And again, the universe would test him. That same year, he had an aneurysm. So dangerous, he was given last rites. But surgery saved him. And he went back to work in the Senate, served six terms, often controversially. We must take back to the streets. Can you tell the committee what was the most embarrassing of all the incidences that you have alleged. Like heck we can't tell the Iraqis what to do. It's our blood and treasure. Throughout, he maintained close relationships on both sides of the aisle, trying to stake the ground of conciliation. That and his long tenure, part of what appealed for Barack Obama when he chose Biden as his vice president. I accept your nomination to run and serve with Barack Obama. He rolled up those sleeves again, taking on gun violence, infrastructure spending, and somehow that unlikely duo developed an extraordinary friendship. I'm Bo Biden, and Joe Biden is my dad. But darkness would come again. His son, Bo, died from brain cancer in 2015. His thoughts of running for president in 2016 crowded out by his grief. So many thought his political career was maybe done. The Presidential Medal of Freedom. But he said he couldn't shake Bo's urgings, that he needed to run for president, and he now stands at the edge of its grasp a man whose views have evolved with age and experience. No, we haven't always gotten things right, but I've always tried. A practicing Catholic, he says he supports Roe v. Wade, LGBTQ rights. He also wants to reform health care, immigration, and support the middle class. A son of Pennsylvania who launched his campaign there and then ultimately watched his political fortunes determined there. Well, for more on the challenges ahead for Joe Biden, we're joined now by Chris Shomara Vigneraja, who's a former official in the Obama administration, and Kelly Jane Torrance, a Canadian and conservative who sits on the editorial board of the New York Post. And let's start first with this moment from last night. I pledge to be a president who seeks not to divide, but unify, who, who doesn't see red states and blue states, only sees the United States. And here's a question I'm going to put to both of you. You first, Kelly, though. What, what are the challenges ahead for Biden as he tries to be this unifying president? Ian, that's a great question because I think Biden has a lot of challenges ahead of him to unify this country. You have 70 million people in America who voted for Donald Trump. Um, and, you know, I love that Biden is talking about unifying the country moving forward, but a lot of Democrats are talking a little differently. Uh, you know, people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a uh, congresswoman here in New York, has talked about, and other Democrats have too, about a list. People who support Donald Trump are going to be on a list, and we're never going to forget that they support Donald Trump. That is not a unifying statement. And I see a lot of Democrats saying that everybody who voted for Donald Trump is a racist. Uh, this is also not a unifying statement. There are a lot of reasons to vote for Donald Trump besides uh, his views on race. I think a lot of people voted because he had a booming economy before the pandemic, which in fact had record low unemployment numbers. 
uh, for Blacks and Hispanics. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I, I worry. I think I think we, the country does need to unify. I'm not sure the Democrats are ready to do that. I hope that they listen to Joe Biden and, you know, welcome anybody who voted for Donald Trump. But that's not what I'm seeing from the Democrats this week. Yeah, so let me jump in, Krish, uh, from the Democratic side of things. What about those challenges to unify and, and, and to do it without, I guess, pushing away all those people or many of those people who voted for Trump? This is a theme that uh, President-elect Biden has been striking, um, not just in his victory speech last night, but throughout the campaign. Um, this is not just a, a cover he's put on um, now that he's the victor. And I think that's really important to highlight. When people talk about the Democratic Party and AOC and, and others, that's not who the Democratic Party is when we talk about the president-elect and the moment that we face right now. Um, Vice President Biden is the fearless leader of the Democratic Party, and the tone he continues to strike is talking about healing. The challenges that he face, it faces right now is bringing together a country when we have a common enemy that is far beyond the divides that we're talking about. We had record highs in terms of the pandemic, for example, an economic crisis. And that's why the, the country has to come together. So we have about two minutes left. I'm going to ask uh, each of you a question, but really we only have about a minute for the answer. And, uh, and Kelly, let me start with you. We are hearing from very few prominent Republicans congratulating Biden, making it clear that they accept that this race is over. Why aren't we hearing from more? It's a great question, Ian. And we have heard, for example, from George W. Bush, the last Republican president. But, you know, here's the thing. Uh, you know, Donald Trump still has a lot of legal challenges left. And people think it's driven only by Trump, but it's not. It's also his supporters. I have gotten messages from many Donald Trump supporters who are hoping he will exhaust all legal remedies because there have been some irregularities and people are concerned about that. Uh, obviously, I think this election was won by Joe Biden and it's going to turn out that way, but Donald Trump supporters do feel that there were irregularities that have not been addressed. And so I think a lot of Republicans are reluctant to talk about it because they want Donald Trump to exhaust all those legal remedies. Well, you know, there doesn't need to be a rush. Obviously, if Joe Biden won, as it looks like he did, uh, he will be the next president. So uh, I think Republicans will will recognize that, but they want Donald Trump to exhaust all of his legal remedies. And, Chris, you know, some so there is an interpretation here that the reluctance of Republicans, uh, prominent Republicans to speak, is because Trump has such a hold on the party, and even after he leaves the White House, will continue to have a hold on the party. We have less than a minute. Do you worry about that, the, the looming and continuing presence of Donald Trump? Yeah, I do, um, because I know that, uh, you know, regardless of what uh, President Trump chooses to do after uh, he leaves the White House, Trumpism is going to continue um, to exist. And um, some number of those 70 million who voted for him are continuing, um, you know, are going to continue to be politically active, which is great. Um, you know, it's important for our democracy um, to be as energized as what we've seen in the last few weeks. But I do fear that, um, you know, part of why you're seeing some Republicans who have chosen not to speak is either because of fear of a backlash from Trump supporters or um, because they want to be opportunistic. Um, you know, the, mm -hmm. the presidential candidates and the waiting on the Republican side, I think there are some number of them who believe that they don't want to ostracize, um, right. you know, the voters who came out this election. All right. Well, it's been a long week. And it's a late night, and I really appreciate both of you talking with us. Chris O'Mara, Vignaraja, and Kelly Jane Torrance, thanks so much. Thanks, Ian. Up next, reflecting on a historic win, what VP-elect Kamala Harris means for women. But first, as we go to break, a look at how future generations watch that moment unfold. Poisson. And tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, a Jeopardy superfan on the life and legacy of Alex Trebek. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. 
Kamala Harris's life is one of accomplishment, determination, and shattering barriers. Remarked upon as far back as 1980s Montreal, where she graduated high school. She was the first black and South Asian woman to be Attorney General of California, to represent that state in the U.S. Senate, and now to be Vice President of the United States, a milestone many are celebrating. Please welcome the Vice President-elect of the United States of America, Kamala Harris. We were taking photos of our TV and screaming, jumping up and down. Dream with ambition. Lead with conviction. We have just been so in awe of her. Hi, my name is Avani Hamilton. I live in San Francisco, California. We, the people, have the power to build a better future. It was a historical moment that was just chilly. Waking up every day, thinking of you and your family. It was like an out-of-body experience. My name's Wanda Kagan, and um, I'm the be a best friend of Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. Yeah, baby! Ever since the election started, I've been really interested, and that's unusual for me, because usually um, I find politics boring. Every little girl watching tonight sees that this is a country of possibilities. My name is Shasta Kapadia and I am nine years old. And um, I love it even more because I'm also from South Asia myself. So it's just even more inspiring to see someone who, come, who comes from where I'm from become vice president-elect. But while I may be the first woman in this office, I will not be the last. That line just really spoke to me and just seeing her and seeing myself in her and that she is someone who is representing me in a place that I never saw myself. And it had to be a powerful moving message, you know, to resonate to the, to, to the, um, to the world. And to the woman most responsible for my presence here today, my mother, Shamala Gopalan Harris, who is always in our hearts. Like I knew for sure she would mention her mother and what her mother meant to her in this moment. But she believed so deeply in an America where a moment like this is possible. And another part of the speech I love was when they said, we are going to heal the soul of America. To unite our country and heal the soul of our nation. That was, that was amazing. And I am just so excited to see what she will do and the change that she will make. After the break, what Alex Trebek meant to his fans. His message to me as a young boy was clear. Be you. Why his legacy extends beyond Jeopardy. That's next in our moment. I've been uh, very lucky in my career, uh, throughout my career. Gone from one show to another show. Even shows that didn't succeed helped me. Mm -hmm. And they all prepared me for the show that many people feel I was destined to host. And if that's the case, hey, good. That was such a good interview. The late Alex Trebek talking to our Rosemary Barton last year. His career spanned decades, his contribution immense. Reflections from some of his fans are tonight's moment. He told me it was okay to just go out and learn all these things about the world. And I think that's probably the most paramount thing to his legacy is that he just wanted the world to be a little smarter every day. His message to me as a young boy was clear. Be you, be smart. I'm gonna miss how he would sometimes uh, overpronounce words unnecessarily and how he'd sometimes he'd have to rap or slip into a character voice. Jeopardy is nothing without Alex Trebek. And it not only kept me entertained, it also kept me simulated because that would make me try and answer questions, read up stuff. I, I realized something, that it wasn't just about learning English or, or helping understand the culture, 
but in a sense, with all those trivia questions, you suddenly learned about not just the history, but the rich diversity of the culture in the world that we're living in, about Western civilization itself. So interesting to hear how deep his impact was. And I should, before we go, note the passing of another great Canadian, Howie Meeker. He was uh, the Rookie of the Year for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, he was an MP, but many of us remember him as uh, a groundbreaking analyst on Hockey Night in Canada. That is The National for November the 8th. Good night.